Um, well, it's, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Holly Fernbach, who is a marine, uh, marine mammal researcher um, at uh, SR3, uh, Sea Life Response Rehabilitation and Re uh, Research, a Seattle area nonprofit dedicated to welfare of marine wildlife in the Northeast Pacific. For more than two decades, she has worked with government, NGO, and academic research groups on studies to support the conservation of whales and dolphins in US waters and internationally. Holly graduated with a PhD from the University of uh, Aberdeen in the UK in 2012 with her research currently, and research co currently involves using individual-based data to study the demography and health of whale populations around the world. Dr. Fernberg Bach and her colleagues pioneered the use of remotely operated drones to non-invasively assess the health of free-ranging cetaceans. She currently uses both uh, photographic mark recapture and aerial photogrammetry um, to assess the status and health of killer whales in the North Pacific with a focus on the endangered population of Southern resident killer whales, um, killer humpback and minke whales in the Antarctic Peninsula and the North Pacific gray whales. It's really a, a pleasure to uh, invite Holly to talk to us all tonight. Um, and I'm excited to hear more about SR3 and the wonderful work you're doing in support of a really special species um, that we have here in uh, North America, in the United States. Um, and I just wanna share also that Marine Mammal Care Center has a current project in association with the Pacific Marine Mammal Center and National Marine Mammal Foundation where we're working with students um, in Southern California um, to uh, address the issue of Southern resident killer whales um, in, in our region, uh, because I feel, and I think we all feel that the, the status of these species um, is an important issue for everyone, not just a regional issue of the Pacific Northwest. So I'm interested to learn more about um, the subject and to hear more from Holly. Holly, go ahead and take okay. it away. Great, thanks. I don't, well, I don't have to introduce myself very much, so <laughs> that was good. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Southern Resident Killer Rail um, Aerial Photogrammetry, and so I'm going to step you through a little bit of the, the history um, and then uh, show you what all we can do with our aerial images that we collect. Uh, but to start off with, um, I wanted to introduce myself a little more and SR3, and I'm the Marine Mammal Research Director of SR3, which is Sea Life Response, Rehabilitation and Research. Uh, and we are a nonprofit that's dedicated to, to promoting the health and welfare of marine wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we actually are a fairly baby group. We um, were started in 2017, and then we were able to open up a rehab facility um, in April of 2021. Here you can see so, some images of that. Um, this is a temporary facility and we're hoping to um, build a, a permanent structure actually across the parking lot from where you see now um, in the next couple of years. And it's located in Des Moines, Washington, which is just south of Seattle. Um, we had a very successful first season. I was actually just saying today, these numbers are so small um, compared to what you guys get down down south in Southern California, but uh, we had a really successful first season. Uh, number of responses were 52, primarily harbor seals, but we also get some some other um, uh, endangered species, even with the, the Guadalupe fur seal. And then we um, had a, a green sea turtle um, that came in this year. So we have a number of different species that, um, that we do respond to. Uh, we were able to successfully release um, 26 individuals. Um, two have been held over into 2022, and then two threatened and endangered species. So it's been exciting to get the, the rehab side of things off the ground. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I'm the, the research director, um, and my research focuses on assessing whale health. And so this is just, I put together this collage of images that we've collected throughout the years, just to show some examples um, you can see some that probably look quite familiar, some of the common dolphins and bottlenose dolphins from Southern California. I actually lived in Southern California for a total of about 15 years before relocating up here. Um, and so we have a number of projects that are still ongoing um, off of uh, San Diego area and off of Santa Catalina Island. But this just gives you an example. And as Dave mentioned in my introduction, uh, the studies range from, from up here um, in the Pacific Northwest um, all the way down to Antarctica, where we study a number of different species. 
Uh, this just shows you where I am right now. I'm actually, I live in the San Juan Islands. Um, I actually live on Stewart Island, which is off of San Juan Island proper. I'm totally off the grid and only accessible by, by small boat and plane, but that just gives you an idea of where I am now. A long way from Encinitas where I used to live, but we've been up here for about three years full time. Um, hold on. Yeah. Uh, and so I just wanted to start off by showing you this, this very basic food web. Um, and you can see that it ranges from top consumers like blue whale here and top predators like killer whales all the way down to all the zooplankton and, and phytoplankton. And it's just really important to understand the health of top consumers and top predators. And I'll be talking to you about top predators today because um, it provides us a lot of really useful information about the health of the ecosystem in which they reside. Uh, and this is just a, an image of a, a stranded killer whale. And you can see how large they are. And if we're really interested in, in, in assessing their health, we can't just put them on a scale. We can't take them to a doctor's office like or a vet's office like you can um, with a vet uh, and with your pet dog. So it's something that we needed to figure out how we could remotely assess the health of individuals um, with minimal disturbance. Um, and this, our research is a team effort. Um, here's a picture of of me, um, along with my, um, actually my husband and, and my key colleague, John Durbin. Uh, we are on the old SR3 research vessel here. And John's holding Maximus the Octocopter, and this is our primary research tool. And I will tell you lots more about that. You can see San Juan Islands in the background, and this was taken during some of our Southern Resident Killer Whale um, health assessment work. Um, no southern resident killer whales. I don't know how familiar um, you guys are with this population. They're icons of the Pacific Northwest. They've been studied for more than 40 years. You can see this is a picture of K21 from KPOD in front of the Seattle waterfront. Um, they've been able to be studied as well as they have because of this urban occurrence. And they're very wide ranging. They range down as far south, some of the pods with central coastal California. Um, and some of them range as far north as south, southeast Alaska. Uh, it is an endangered population. There are currently 73 individuals as per the Center for Well Research census in 2021, although we've had two new calves born in 2022. Um, so you're looking at 75 individuals. And three key threats have been identified, um, contaminants in their food and water, um, impacts from, from vessels, both physical and acoustic disturbance, and declines in their primary prey abundance. And they are Chinook salmon specialists. So this decline in prey abundance, I'm referring to Chinook salmon. You can see here's a little juvenile from Elpod chasing a, a very large um, Chinook salmon. And so this is, this is the prey population that they rely on, but very sadly, it's been um, declining um, over, over the past several decades. And many of their, um, the stocks they rely on are classified as endangered themselves. Um, and I like to show this because you could see the date here. It's back to 2008. Um, and are, are the orcas starving? It's always been a concern. Are they getting enough food with these declines and, and the salmon runs? Um, one of our, our colleagues, John Ford, um, published a seminal paper back in 2009 um, showing the correlation between Chinook abundance and um, mortality of southern resident killer whales. And you can see that the increased mortality is linked to declines in Chinook salmon abundance. So you have these pronounced declines in abundance. You could see here, especially in the period of the 1990s, and this was followed by years of increased mortality for the population. But despite all of this attention, you know, back dating back to, you know, 2008 and earlier, you could see that this is from the Seattle Times in 2019, you're still seeing the same um, news articles and, and, and media coverage that the decline of the salmon continues and the plight of the southern resident killer whales also continues. Um, and so back in 2008, we were really interested, again, in this remote health checkup. And so could we um, collect aerial images? And you could see this unique perspective. Um, you're looking down at the whales. You can see how fat they are, how thin they are. So we were really interested in, in, in assessing um, how the individuals in the population were doing. We're now on the 15th year of this research. Um, and again, we started in 2008. It's very different than what we do now. And I showed you with the, the octocopter, we started using manned aircraft. So here you can see um, 
John and I hanging out of the side of the, the helicopter. We just used a, a digital SLR camera and collected these aerial images. We had two efforts back in, in 2008, and then we didn't, weren't able to get funding again until 2013. Um, but we were successful in collecting these, these aerial images, high resolution aerial images that we could use um, to assess the population. And we shifted in 2014 to using drones. Um, we actually um, pioneered the use of drones for, for aerial photogrammetry we, of free ranging whales. We were the first group to do this. And we actually did this up in off of Vancouver Island with the um, neighboring Northern resident killer whale population and then shifted to, to using it with the Southern residents. Uh, we started off with this little APH-22 hexacopter. Um, then you can see um, here me holding this, this larger octocopter. This is actually um, off of Piedras Blanca's lighthouse where this picture was taken for some of our, our gray whale work uh, near Cambria, just south of Big Sur. Um, but you can see the size difference. Um, and I'll get into the details of why we've moved to, to such a larger drone. But we basically, this is just a tool um, for flying a camera above the whales. Again, we want to be able to collect these high resolution aerial images um, that we use to, it, to assess the health and monitor growth of individuals. Uh, they can be readily launched and retrieved at sea. You can see an example here of, of me retrieving the octocopter. This is just off of, of Everett in Washington. Um, it's much more efficient. We can stay out um, all day if we need to, um, do as many flights as we need to, to to collect the data. We used to be very limited when we used the manned aircraft. Uh, we could go out for an hour, an hour and a half, and it was really expensive. Um, and it was much more dangerous. So this is a much safer um, operation and allows us to collect a lot of data very easily. Um, this was taken just the other day during a gray whale survey. Um, you can see now this is the, the SR3 rib that we use currently. Um, we're able, again, to easily um, launch and retrieve from, um, from a number of different sized vessels. We, in Antarctica, we um, work from a really small um, Zodiac rib. You can see this is a, a larger rib here. Uh, this was actually taken off of Santa Catalina Island, um, and you could see, again, it's just a, another image of our ops, like a variety of different vessels. This was taken off of a, of a larger dive boat. Uh, and it's extremely non-invasive research, and it's one of the things that we like to really stress about our research is that we're trying to have a minimal footprint on the population, because as I mentioned, one of the key threats to the population um, is disturbance from vessels, both acoustic and, and physical disturbance. And so we're able to, to position our, our research vessels several hundred yards away from the whales. You could see the arrow um, there shows the the drone above the whale, we fly at a permitted altitude of greater than 100 feet. Um, and so again, we're able to, to give them this health checkup without them even knowing that we're there. And all of these flights um, are conducted under a NIP permit and FAA authorization. I used to always joke that the, the paperwork weighed more than the drone itself, but everything that we do um, is authorized. We also conduct flights um, in Canada. And again, we have authorization and permits from um, DFO. Uh, and the Department of Transport in Canada. I have a little video here to show. Just to, this is when we were using the, the hexacopter. And this is John here. And this gives you just a perspective. We just collect. Um, still images but this what you can see here you can actually see we did some some recording of video but i actually am the ground station um operator and so i um will call out the altitude um monitor the the battery and try to keep these whales in the frame so i'm actually the eyes of the drone that i guide the drone over so i'll I'll get them to go, um, I'll say forward, forward, right, right, left, left, and actually um, guide the drone over the whales. And again, we're collecting images. This is when we used to collect at about a one second interval. Now we collect at about a, um, every uh, half second. So we're able to collect thousands of images um, just even in a single, a single day. We're trying to get images like this. Um, you could see, you could see the edges really nicely. It's a nice flat whale. This is another example. Um, it's one of the things that we aren't lucky enough always to get such beautiful, clear water, um, but you just just give you an idea of what kind of the perfect picture would look like. Um, so then we're able to get a number of different different measurements and I've stepped through that. Uh, this just it's a fun example of um, something that we took this past year of, of the J41s. 
Um, and one of the first things that we needed to establish when we started collecting all of these aerial images was that we could actually identify individuals. And as I, I mentioned, um, the Southern resident killer whale population has been studied for more than 40 years. Um, so all of these individuals have known ages and sexes, which is really, really unique. So we're able to link our measurements um, to these known individuals, but we needed to establish that we could do that. Um, so you could see from the top, um, these are the aerial images and on the bottom, you could see that these are boat based images examples that you could see that you could barely clearly see um, these distinct pigmentation patterns on the, the saddle patch that white saddle patch that are used to identify individuals. Um, so we were able to successfully um, establish that we could identify individuals, we could link our measurements um, to all of these individuals, uh, thanks to the work of, of the Center for Whale Research that has been studying them and doing the population monitoring for more than 40 years. And you've heard photogrammetry said a, a couple of times, and I had it in the, the title on photogrammetry is very simply on um, the science of making measurements from photographs. So this is just another example of a photograph. You can see that the really nice edges here. Uh, we take a series of different measurements. This just gives you a couple different examples, uh, some, such as body length. Um, and then condition profiles, and I'll step through a few others. We can take more than 60 measurements from just a single image. Um, and if we have the known altitude sensor width and focal length, we can get really, really precise measurements of length, so less than a centimeter, which is really important when we're trying to estimate the size of individuals, seeing if they're growing like they should. Um, we are also collected a series of measurements that are used to monitor, as I mentioned, growth, but also nutritional and reproductive status. And so one of the first um, papers that we were able to, to come out with, and um, this was done from the, the manned aircraft work back in 2008, uh, is that we were able to estimate size at age for the majority of the population. We've now done that for the entire population. Um, so you could see that the length is in meters along the left axis, and you can see the age of the individuals across the bottom. Um, and the, the black dots that you see are females, um, and then the gray dots are males. And so one of the things that we were able to do, first time that the size had been estimated for the population, um, then we were also able to show that they, their growth slows, they have this asymptotic length. So for, for females, it's about 15 years of age, and for males, it's a little bit later at 21. Um, but what we were surprised to see, although I guess it's not that surprising when you see that, think back to that trend of the, the 1990s and the, the correlation between Chinook salmon and, and um, increased mortality, is that the younger females um, aren't getting as big as the older females. So you could see that circle, the younger females, after they've stopped growing, um, they're not getting to be as big. And you can see that highlighted by the, the blue circle. And we suggested that this was due to nutritional stress during that really important time for these females, which fell into that 1990 time period um, where you saw that market decline in Chinook salmon abundance. And then one of the other things um, that I mentioned that we do is that we monitor, monitor body condition. So I'm gonna talk quite a bit about that. Um, and killer whales, you could see that they have these white eye patches, which makes it very easy um, for us to, to assess changes in condition for individuals. It's much more difficult, difficult with, with other species, but um, I'm always very thankful that killer whales have these nice white eye patches. Uh, this gives you two examples of adult males. This is a Northern resident killer whale on the left, this image was taken just a couple of days before he died. In contrast, you could see the southern resident on the right, and you could see how robust this animal is. He's like a bloated tick. Um, and you could see that the difference if you look at these eye patches. So when animals lose condition, they lose this adipose tissue behind their skull. So you could see that they lose fat along the entire body axis, looking at this whale on the left, but you could also see that those eye patches trace the shape of the skull. In contrast, when an animal is in very robust condition, you could see that these eye patches angle outwards. And so this is something we use this, this eye patch, and I'll talk a little bit more about it with this eye patch ratio to provide quantitative metrics of health um, for management groups to, to hopefully be able to use in adaptive management decisions and to, to guide conservation actions. And so this just shows you another example. And when, when you have this really pronounced fat loss behind the, the skull, we refer to it as, as peanut head. And you could see why if you think about the shape of um, one of those peanuts that you crack. 
Um, and you could see here, this is this is an individual that's on the left that's still still alive. And you could look at those eye patches and you could see how they angle outwards. And in the center here, this is an individual, this image was taken a month before this female died. You can see she's lost fat along her entire body axis, but also you can see that the eye patches start to trace the shape of the skull. There's actually a Northern resident on the right side here. This was taken a week before she died. And you could see that really, really pronounced fat loss. You can see again, it traces the shape of the skull. So we developed a, a metric, and this is the eye patch ratio, that we could, could actually capture this fat loss that could capture um, uh, this change in condition, uh, very robust tool. And it's called the eye patch ratio. And it's very simply, it's just a ratio um, of the, the measurements between the eye patches um, on the bottom and the top. And it provides us with this metric, and we can monitor individual change over time. And so this just gives you three examples. Now you have a, the images of the adult females on the bottom, J41, J17, and J16. And on the top, you could see that there are three different graphs showing their eye patch ratios. And so you see the eye patch ratio um, ranges from below one to, to above 1.3 on the left axis. And this goes across our entire time series. So you could see it dates back to 2008. And the gray lines that you see um, are Basically, it's the entire population, and it's the eye patches that are the connected, you could see over time. Um, and the black lines that you see show the individual that's imaged below. Um, you could see that the J41, she's very robust in that image, but you could see that you have that increasing um, condition throughout the time series. In contrast, J17, you could see this marked decline in her condition, um, and actually she continued to decline um, until she died. But you could see again how we were able to, to monitor these changes. And this was just at the September sampling interval, and I'll talk more about it, but we're, we're monitoring changes throughout the years now. Then you have J16. Um, this individual, she was, she was declining. Um, she ended up actually losing her calf, but then after she lost her calf, she actually rebounded and she's improved in condition. But this just give you three examples of how we're able to, to use this eye patch ratio to monitor um, changes for the entire population. And I mentioned this J17, that they had that marked decline until, um, until death. You could see the images um, along the bottom here. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do, and it's one of really helped us provide um, uh, these um, informative metrics to management groups is that we've been able to classify individuals based on body condition classes. So based on all of that data that we have on the condition of the population over time, uh, we're able to, to split them into different groups. So calves, juveniles, subadult, um, adult females, adult males, um, and senescent females are the different categories. And then we're able to place them in these body condition classes. So they're separated between the 20% intervals um, in each class. And if they fall into the top 20th percent, that they're this body condition five, you could see the image on the left when she's quite robust. Um, and if they're in the bottom 20%, you could see they fall into that body condition class one. So you could see how thin she is in that 2017 and even 2018 picture before she died. And so this is something that we're able to, to identify, and I'll talk more about this, but animals of concern uh, when they fall into this body condition class one, um, so this poor condition class. Um, but the, the graph at the top just shows you the eye patch ratios across the left against age for the entire population. You could see males and females are in the, the orange and the blue. Um, and you see that marked decline for J17 highlighted in the, the black circles. So this just shows you um, how robust this tool is, again, of, of monitoring these changes. Um, but all of this information also allows us to, to place them in these body condition classes that we can provide um, to management. There you can see that's highlighted with that J17's decline. And, and why does it matter what body condition class they're in? Um, well, if they're in the lowest per, lowest 20th percentile, that body condition class one, we've actually found a two to three times likelihood of mortality. And so you have this elevated um, risk of mortality if they fall into this body condition class one. So we kind of feel like it's an early warning system that we can identify whales that are in very poor condition that have been declining in condition um, and that some adaptive management changes might be able to be made um, to help ensure that they have an adequate supply of prey. 
Um, now, this is just going to show you a couple a couple images. This is J56. It's a current whale of concern. And this is a, a young calf um, who was born in um, 2020. And, and you could see from the first image on the left uh, in um, July, you could see that it looked quite lean. And you could see that the color is a little bit off. It's that, that nice black shiny that you expect um, to see for killer whales. It, it's very almost gray in color. And so this is an individual that we identified as an animal of concern. So poor condition and this body condition class one um, that you have this lean condition, the interesting um, changes and in, in pigmentation. This just shows you a couple of the more recent pictures from 2021. You can see that the skin gets to be quite blotchy almost. Um, and you can look at that pronounced. You could see how thin those, those eye patches are, how they're starting to shape, trace the shape of the skull. And if you look at this image um, showing the side of the animal, this isn't what a, a young killer whale should look like. This is quite a lean individual. And we're actually, we're not really sure if we're gonna see this whale again. It's been declining, it's declined even further. Uh, we recently were able to image it in, in April. Um, but again, we have been providing all of this information to management groups and, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but there were some emergency rules that were issued um, by Washington Department of Fisheries and Wildlife asking for more space from commercial vessels for these whales. And again, this is an early warning system. So just to stress again how, how robust this, um, this metric is and monitoring change over individual uh, changes in for individuals over time. Uh, you could see the, the eye patch ratio here on the left across the entire time series. All of those individuals that you see highlighted in black um, declined prior to their death. And so you could see eight of the 10 deaths since um, the 2015 to 2019 period were preceded by this decline in condition. So again, if we can identify individuals in, in poor condition and declining condition, then it, it's something that we're hoping that we can um, provide this as an early warning system to management groups. Um, and it's, it's, again, I keep on mentioning this adaptive management. Um, this just shows you at the condition index on the left across time. Um, and this is the proportion of non-poor individuals and so, um, or individuals in non-poor condition. Um, so you could see that when you um, have, that you have the pot abundance with the red and the condition and the, and the black. And you could see that when you have these marked declines um, in condition, they're followed by declines in abundance. So again, this is an, an early warning system the year before, if we see a really high level and a high proportion of individuals um, that are in poor condition, then we can actually again inform management groups um, and adaptive management decisions might be able to be made. Um, and we're very interested in linking body condition to prey. Here are just several images again of, of Southern resident killer whales chasing Chinook salmon. Um, one of the things that um, has been a, a big issue actually in, in the conservation and the recovery of Southern resident killer whales is that we know what they feed on, um, but they roam around a lot. And so there are a number of different um, salmon stocks that they, they, that they target, they rely on. And so it's one of the things that a number of different groups have tried to do is try to identify what, what stock might be most important for them and what time of year. Uh, it's something that we were recently able to do actually with a postdoc that was based um, down in La Jolla, uh, Southwest History Science Center that worked with us. And we were able to link our entire team um, series of, of body condition um, to prey. And so you could see on the left, this is just a probability of growth um, or staying um, stable for individuals. And you could see there's a very high correlation um, with the Fraser River Chinook, so coming out of, of Canada. Um, so this is the first time that you've been able to link body condition to a particular prey run, uh, salmon run, which is really important for, for management, ensuring these whales have enough food. Uh, you can see salmon abundance is, is along the, the bottom axis. And for LPOD, it's not as strong of a correlation, but it is still a correlation um, with Puget Sound Chinook. And this was just using our, our September data. So we've been able to, to link body condition and changes in body condition with Chinook salmon availability um, and abundance. But one of the things that we're doing now is that we're, and we're continuing to do is, is looking at seasonal changes. Um, this is the same individual, you can see September, May and September. You can see just from looking, and again, you could focus on those eye patches, you can see these, these changes and more robust on the, 
the left side, much leaner in May, and then a little bit more robust in September. Um, so we're interested in if and when individuals change. And that's really important, again, for identifying what, what prey runs, what salmon stocks most, might be most important. Um, and you could see with the, the eye patch ratio here on the left, um, and on the bottom, you could see that it's September is the 0 0.0 and May is the 0.5. And so this just shows you a, a couple of examples of May and September sampling periods. We used to only collect data in, in May and September, and now we've shifted to doing the year-round data collection since we live here. And this is just for one match line of the Southern Resident Killer Whales, the J16s. But you could see we can detect with this eye patch ratio um, these declines. And so you have animals that are in better condition, um, better condition in September, and then they decline in condition in May, and then they improve in condition, and then they decline again. So again, this is really important. Um, and just this year already, we've been able to collect data and, and um, aerial images in January, February, and April, which is really exciting. It's some of the first winter data um, for, for LPOD and the population. Um, and it's one of the things that we're really trying to, to, to get data from all of the months of the year, um, if possible. They don't come around into these waters as much anymore, but, but to see again, um, when are they in the best condition? When do they really struggle? Um, and that could help guide these management actions. And again, this is just a, an example of, of um, a release that, that we need to help prioritize these West Coast Chinook salmon stocks. Um, this is what we're gonna need for the, the Southern Resident Killer Whale recovery. So all of the information that, that we can provide from our body condition monitoring, and then other groups are doing um, diet, um, diet studies and collecting at different times of the year. But we can all work together to, to help provide this information to management groups. Um, and I've also mentioned that we monitor growth. Um, and so this is an example um, with uh, that shows little J50. Unfortunately, um, this is that this calf died. And this is actually when I was mentioning J16 that it declined in condition um, and lost her calf. This was this was the female and her little one. Um, but J50, similar to what we're seeing with J56, was always an animal of concern, was always very lean, um, never really appeared to grow um, like it should. You can see this is just an example. Um, you have length um, on the left and the age. You could see the J50 is highlighted on the red, that despite being older than the rest of the whales, it was much smaller. Um, and so this is something that um, we're, we're providing um, management groups with information on. Also, when we identify whales that aren't growing as they should. So you could see just from these length estimates, we can um, have an idea of how big they should be. Um, and if they aren't reaching that size, then we can um, you know, provide an alert for these whales that aren't growing as they should. And we also monitor reproduction. Um, and so this is something that we've been able to do very successfully. Um, we can detect pregnancies. So you can you can see this individual here and something that jumps out is um, you could see how robust the animal is in the middle. And so just like humans when they're pregnant, um, killer whales get to get big around the middle. Uh, their gestation is almost 18 months, and so they have about a 17 and a half um, month gestation, so they carry these little ones for a long time. Um, but you can really see this, especially in the late stage pregnancy, this, this midsection um, starting to pop out. So this just gives you an example. This is J35. You can see the image in September 2019. I have the red line drawn. She's five and a half months pregnant here. But then you can see how much that changes going to 15 and a half months. You can see she's really big in the middle. Um, and then look at her in September 2020. I always think they look quite awkwardly um, <laughs> pregnant. They can't surface quite as flat as they as they normally do, but you can see they're kind of hunched over. But she is, um, this was taken just a couple days before she successfully gave birth. So you could see here's J35 with little J57. We're always excited to see new new additions to the Southern resident um, population. But as I you know mentioned with the, the J16 example, and there have been several other examples in recent years that um, if they don't have enough food to support themselves, then they aren't going to be able to support their little ones and then their other offspring um, as they do live in their, their family groups their entire life. And so it's really important to, to add a, you know, to make sure that they have access um, to as much prey as they can. Um, and so just to increase that abundance and availability as well. Um, and one of the, one of the, I, 
things that's really impacting the growth of southern resident killer whales is this really high level of, of reproductive loss. Um, and so both from our photogrammetry research and from um, work from the University of Washington colleagues there with, with hormone, uh, we've been able to document that about two thirds of the pregnancies aren't successful. So here you can see this is a female from K-Pod, K-27. Um, and we were able to capture this image. She came up. We actually, when we first saw it, and just from, from my view, I thought she was carrying um, a salmon, but you could see that it's actually an aborted fetus. Um, and she carried it around for a short amount of time, and then it, it disappeared, and, and the carcass was never recovered. But this was the first time we've documented something like this, but we, we regularly um, are able to, to document um, reproductive loss. This is a, a recent example, J36. Um, you could see how heavily pregnant she was in, in September 2021, uh, but you could see the more recent picture on the right that we collected in, in February. You could see that she's clearly lost this pregnancy. So this is something that, we're, um, that we document regularly, uh, identify if individuals are pregnant, and then document this, this reproductive loss. Um, but one of the things that I really find scale um, monitoring is also allowing us to do uh, is to really pinpoint when they lose um, this, this, their um, pregnancy. Because one of the things we, when we used to just do the May and September, it didn't provide us with a resolution that having this winter monitoring provides us. So we could clearly see um, that she lost it between um, September and February. Um, and we're, we have another a number of different um, comparative studies that are ongoing as well. Um, you can see the Alaska resident. Um, where I'm actually heading there uh, on Saturday for two weeks. Um, northern residents, you can see at the northern end of Vancouver Island with the blue star, and then the southern residents, you can see at the, the southern end of Vancouver Island. Um, and one of the important things about these comparative studies is that they have different population trajectories, um, but they all access, they all eat salmon and they access them um, from different runs and at different, different times of the year that they, they move around. Um, and so it's really important um, to, to compare growth, um, body size uh, and body condition of these three different populations. Um, and the northern residents, I mentioned, this is actually the first time we used um, drones over free-ranging whales. And you can see this is a, a match line, the I-16s here. We were just blown away um, when we went. This is one of the first images we ever collected, actually. It's just the, the resolution and, and how much that you could, um, you know, glean from all of these images. But we did this study in, in collaboration with colleagues at the Vancouver Aquarium from 2014 to 2017. Um, you can see that they they um, they do have some overlap um, in their range, but but typically you have the um, northern residents off of that northern end of Vancouver Island, whereas the southern residents typically occur off the the southern end of Vancouver Island and more in the Salish Sea and Washington waters. Um, but the difference in, in abundance trends is quite dramatic with, with southern and northern residents that you could see uh, northern residents in, in red, um, they are increasing. Um, uh, they've been increasing in abundance. They're starting to level off a little bit more. Um, and in contrast to the southern residents that um, have actually been declining um, in, in recent years, but you could see a much smaller um, population number um, and, and very different trajectories. So again, we were interested in, in how these individuals would, would compare both in body size, growth, and, and um, body condition. Um, but one thing, um, I, and I added in back the, with the, the Ford et al. paper, he actually um, compared uh, northern residents as well. And you can see that northern residents and southern residents did have that similar trajectory, so following the declines in the Chinook abundance. So despite the fact that the populations were doing different things and having different um, trajectories, you could see that they were still quite correlated with these changes in Chinook abundance. So one of the things that we documented, um, you can see this is just um, uh, brings back what I what I mentioned with that younger females for the southern resident killer whales not getting as big as the older females, for the northern residents. And this was um, recently published, 2019, by one of our students. Um, you could see it, it actually had that that same trend, and that you had the the younger adult females and the northern residents. They weren't getting as big as the older adult females. So again. Um, it was the result of that period of nutritional stress in the 1990s. And for the Alaska residents, again, um, going to be heading up there on Saturday. 
Uh, you can see that they have a very different, um, very well, it's actually similar to the, the northern residents, but very different than the southern residents that they're, they're increasing um, at a rate of almost 4% a year. So they, they're doing very well. Again, we're very interested in, in how, um, how their body condition um, compares because it's, they, they're actually doing the best of all the, the resident killer whale populations, the Alaska residents. Um, and so we went last year for the first time, we had um, two different field efforts. Uh, this just shows you a couple of example um, images and we're working with North Gulf Oceanic Society. So our colleagues um, up there, um, we're uh, excited to get back up there going for two weeks, May into June, and then again in July. And so we're, we're trying to collect as many aerial images of as many um, known individuals. Again, um, age is known for the majority of the individuals um, and sex is not as well established as the Southern resident killer whales, but we are able to, to link these measurements to, um, to known individuals, which is really important. And again, everything we do, this is to inform conservation measures. Here you could see J41, a little J51, they're slurping down a Chinook salmon. Um, you know, this is something that you see these animals, you'll see them sharing prey. They catch the Chinook salmon and the female will, will share it with all of her, her offspring. Um, but what we're, everything we collect, all of these quantitative metrics is all to, to help recover the population. Uh, and I've mentioned adaptive management decisions a number of times. We're working with management groups, both in Canadian waters and in the U.S. with, with NOAA, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. Um, we're providing our metrics to them. Um, and all of this is with an aim of, of helping to recover the population and ensure that they have an adequate supply of food and access to this food. So it may involve fisheries closures. It may involve um, closures to vessels. It may involve um, changes to um, the amount of um, fish that people could collect. It could involve um, management changes for commercial um, vessels and, and, and whale watching activities. And we're able to provide these near um, real-time health metrics. And again, it's really important so we can um, serve as an early warning system so we could identify these whales of, um, of um, poor body condition, vulnerable whales, whales that aren't growing as they should. And again, this just shows some examples that of when we do identify um, these individuals that are in poor condition, um, we, you know, it's been shared, but you know, all with the media, but then it's also NOAA Fisheries and, and WDFW have, have done these releases asking for more space, identifying these vulnerable individuals. And again, it's this early warning system. And this it was very informal at first. And so we had with Soundwatch, it's a local um, group out on the water, boater education and NOAA Fisheries and Pacific Whale Watch Foundation and WDFW. Um, it was at first just a, a request for space, um, but this past year, and we're continuing um, to work with WDFW um, that they're actually uh, issuing rulings. And so you, based on, on our identification of three pregnant females, um, and of, of J56 as a vulnerable whale, they actually asked you, um, issued rules um, requiring vessels to stay um, at least a half mile away from these whales um, to give them space um, to forage. Um, so this is something that's been just this past year, um, this adaptive management, we're really seeing um, this, this go into to full enforcement and this will be continuing. We're providing them with a, another list of, of whales that are, that are vulnerable, um, pregnant females and whales that aren't growing as they should going into the, the, the summer um, whale watching season for commercial vessels and any kind of management decisions that need to be issued. And again, uh, it's not just abundance, but it's accessibility. And so that's why it's, it's, it's so important that they have an adequate prey supply, but also that they can access it and they're, they're key foraging grounds. Um, and one of the things that we, um, uh, I, I think that it's been surprising to everyone with raising public uh, awareness. This has been a big driver, um, you know, when you have uh, individuals in the public that are aware of the plight of Southern resident killer whales. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on, on management groups, whether it's at a state level or federal level. And so it's something that's always really important no matter where you are, um, is to be aware of what's going on with your, you know, local and national populations. And there are always opportunities um, to provide public input. Um, and so that's always really important that, that our research has been shared. 
um, and that that could be that could be used to to raise awareness and and provide this public input. Almost every um, action with with NOAA, they have a, a period of, of public comment, um, and I know that that's the case, you know, all along the coast with different populations and different management acts. Uh, we also publish our research. Um, you know, we've been again dating back to to 2008, but we regularly. Um, publish, um, whether it's on body condition, um, changes in, in body size, relating it to Chinook salmon abundance. So it's just something that we try to get out as much as we can in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and this is definitely a team effort. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned John in the beginning, um, you know, we've been from the very start working as a, as a team on this, but there have been a number of different analysts. We've worked with a number of different groups. And so it's definitely um, a project that um, has involved, you know, dozens of people. And with funding support, it comes from a variety of different sources. We have a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, SeaWorld, Shell, NOAA, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, a number of different foundations, um, private grants and donations. So it's something that each year we're um, raising money to, to help um, support the project and continue this research. Okay, and I can end there. Um, thank you for giving me your time. Thank you so much my share. For, uh, for the wonderful lecture tonight. We have um, a lot of questions um, <laughs> that have piled up. Um, so Let's uh, <laughs> let's start. A um, couple questions. And I see about. Diane there. I see Diane. I, I see a friendly face there that I know. So <laughs> uh, it, it, there there are a lot of people in, yeah. in, uh, in yeah. our lecture tonight that that I think um, have been following the issue and and have some great questions for you. Um, <laughs> but for those people who may not be as familiar, um, we mentioned you mentioned. Um, the the names of some of the animals the 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 J fifty and and can you can you just describe um, the the naming system for the different pods to help people understand um, what that's all about? Sure, and I realized that as I was stepping through it that it was one of those where I was like, oh, I didn't give the general background of the. Um, so yeah, with Southern Ozone at Killer Rose, uh, you have three pods J K and L. Um, and so they're all based on, you know, from the very beginning, they split them into those different pods. It's the same thing with, with Alaska naming and Northern residents, they're all broken down into to different pods. The Center for Whale Research assigns the names um, each year. So there's actually a little K-pod whale that was recently born um, that hasn't been assigned a, a, a you know, number yet because it hasn't come back up into Washington state for during that census period. But you do, you do, they are all related, but then they're broken down into these, you know, the JK and L pods, and then you have different matcher lines. And I mentioned some of those, like with the J16s and J41s that fall within those pods. Cool, thank you. You also wow. mentioned um, a, a, a specific decline in uh, salmon populations in, in the 90s. Do we know what caused that particular decline? With that particular, and this that was part of a coastwide um, uh, salmon abundance that that was used in, in that study. So it involved, and that was one of the biggest problems, is that it involved kind of everything. And so what we've been working on is actually breaking it down into to more distinct um, stocks and relating that to body condition. Gosh, in the 1990s, I mean, what we're seeing here now um, impacting the, the salmon abundance so much is you, when you have a lot of this warming and you have the blobs, like you mentioned, you know, bringing that UME to, you know, with, with the sea lines that you're seeing these warming water um, conditions that are impacting um, at sea survival. You're also seeing lots of, of drought. There's a lot of work going into restoration. I don't know specifically in the 1990s if it was a warming event that might have might have impacted that, but I know with um, you saw that impacting was it El Nino in the 1990s? I think that impacted the distribution of dolphins. So I would just guess that it was that a, a similar warming event that impacted that at sea survival of the Chinook. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right, here we go. Going back to the beginning of the lecture, <laughs> uh, talking about drones. Um, do you only have one drone um, that you use? No, we have. We have way too many drones, actually. So we um, <laughs> we have, and we keep on getting getting more. We have the octocopter drone um, that we primarily use um, for for our research. We also still have that small the small hexacopter drone, um, um, and we use that uh, in Antarctica because it's easier to to transport. And we also use that to collect blow samples. 
um, from baleen whales, so from humpback whales and minke whales. It's it's you know smaller. We can fly it through through the blow easily. Um, and we actually just got another octocopter drone that the arms fold down um, instead of like we actually have to unscrew the arms on the, the octocopter shed maximus um, that will allow us to transport it a little bit easier because the case is, cases are massive. And so just to be able to, we're actually taking that one up to Alaska with us. Um, so we have three right now. <laughs> Very cool. And if uh, anyone's interested in those blow samples, just Google Snotbot and uh, you'll, you'll find lots of information. Cool. It's actually not this. It's not the snot bot, but it's similar. But there, similar, the snot yeah. bot is a different. Yeah, yeah. But it's a it's a similar. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, battery charge. How long? What's the range of, of different um, lengths of time that a drone can stay up there gathering data for you? Um, and, and that's another reason I should have highlighted with the octocopter drone um, is that one would because of the larger size, um, we can put more batteries in, it could hold more weight. And so we could actually stay um, up with the octocopter for more than 30 minutes. Um, so that's our longest, I think probably like 32, 33 minutes is the longest for that. The, the hexacopter drones typically about uh, 10 minutes or less, even less than that in Antarctica when it's <laughs> really cold and trying to keep the batteries warm. But so it's a big range. And so that's one of the things that was shifting in the size. We also get the, the longer longevity in the flights. Uh, cool. Uh, question from KL. What is the, the most common cause of death in a killer whale? We mentioned you talked a lot about um, lack of food, um, but are there, is that the most common? It's from what, from what we've, for, one of the things with, with, at least with Southern resident killer whales is that the, you, you don't have um, recovery of the carcasses that often. And so the individuals aren't, aren't recovered. And I think one of the things too, with really thin animals that um, they don't have any fat on their body anymore, and they just sink, and then they don't they, they don't resurface. They aren't um, aren't recovered. And so, from what we're able to show of just to, for that example, between 2015 and 2019, that eight of the ten individuals that did die, we were able to document these declines in condition. Um, some of them quite severe declines. And and the paper that I mentioned with Josh Stewart as well also linked body condition. Um, you know, to mortality. So you saw that, you know, two to three times, you know, more likely of, of, of dying if you're in that body condition class one. So for us, it's certainly what we've documented is that poor, poor body condition and declining in condition um, that's been correlated with prey abundance. Um, I think there's been other animals that have washed up. I think there's been one that she had a complication with pregnancy. One was actually a vessel strike. Um, so there've been kind of a mix of, you know, cases that have come in that um, haven't been nutritionally related, but the majority of the evidence, you know, shows this body condition, you know, poor body condition correlated with, with increased mortality. Um, we have a question, hopefully you'll, you'll understand this, is the slightly higher mortality in BC5 related to pregnancy? <laughs> That's actually a very good question. Um, probably so. Yeah, I, it is something that the um, we just have a few individuals um, that uh, were body condition class five um, that did end up dying, and one of those individuals was was pregnant. And so, since you do have that that complication with with pregnancy, that is something that we have seen. One of the we don't have with those body condition class five individuals. Um, we have a much longer time from when they died, and so most of those individuals were more than a year. So they were body condition class five. And then we weren't able to collect images of them, you know, for more than a year and they died. So we don't have that fine scale resolution of, of how quickly they did change or what was going on with them. And so it's something that we're hoping with this, you know, monitoring throughout the year, we're going to be able to, to document that more readily. Um, and then that, that Stuart et al. paper, he actually shows that, that, that most of the individuals in that body condition class one, you know, died within a short amount of time compared to the individuals that did die in body condition class five. But at least one of the body condition class five individuals was was pregnant. I know the last time we sampled her. Oh. Um, thank you. Um, you had shared a, an image of a stranded animal um, early on, and I'm assuming that was a deceased um, animal. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any success in uh, rescue rehab of stranded killer whales? Is that a, is that a thing? 
Um, a number of a number of years ago, there have been some actually, and we were able to. I think she sent successfully had a calf, Springer, which is a northern resident killer whale. Um, there have been some animals that have been um, uh, with her. She was in a in a holding pen. I wasn't actually involved with with that or the killer whale research at the time, but they were able to to rehabilitate her. Uh, and to release her, and she's back with northern resident population, and she might have even had two calves, I think. Um, so in that example, they did, you know, it was kind of an ocean pen, and they did do the rehabilitation. There haven't been, gosh, that's one of the only happy endings I know of, of cases like that that I that I know of. I know with the um, uh, the killer whale effort with the release a number of years ago. Um, uh, I forgot the name of the whale, but it was the one that was in the, the movie that, you know, when they relocated to, to Iceland and it ended up, you know, with all the time that they spent rehabilitating it, that that was not a successful end, that it ended up dying. Um, but I know with Springer, that was a really positive, a positive ending. Um, one of the, one, I think one of the key things is, is that they stay, as I mentioned, they stay with their family groups um, like they do. And so in the case of J50, there was discussion of, of an intervention and potentially capturing J50 to try to rehabilitate um, her, but she was with her, her family and with the rest of the Southern residents for the entire time. So to, to do anything like that is not something that, you know, not something that was, you know, supported by, by a number of people. And so it's really challenging because you can see these animals declining um, but it's, it's, you know, what, what can be done. I mean, that's the big, why, you know, with us, it's the big push of trying to, to work with adaptive management decisions and, you know, hopefully increase the amount of prey they have, but then also the access that they have to that prey. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of prey, um, you know, they, they primarily or prefer to feed on salmon. Um, are those, uh, salmon stocks available year round? Um, they do make movements between summer and winter feeding areas, right? Yeah, they do definitely. Um, and it's one of the one of the reasons they used to be here most days of the year. I mean, you you had a really high occurrence of southern residents around the San Juan Islands, and as you've seen these really marked declines in a number of the runs, they just aren't here anymore. Um, and so, an example is we used to have the dedicated May effort. We didn't even um, where we would be able to sample them. We didn't even expect they haven't been here in May and three years, I think. And so, and because they've, you know, come back, there's just not enough prey available for them. So with the Fraser River run, um, they still come back in September um, and they're able to, to really target that. The Puget Sound, they spend a lot of time with Puget Sound in the winter. So that's definitely seasonally, you know, variable. They're on the um, outer coast now, um, taking advantage of, of, of prey that are available. And it's one of the things a lot of people are quite upset that they aren't here anymore, but as long as they're getting you know, getting what they need, then, you know, they, it's, it's, it's a positive, so. Yeah, one of the things I think is important for any of our listeners today who are from California is that the Southern residents do spend time, um, or potentially, in, in California, um, and, uh, you know, certainly we could be paying attention to our own salmon stocks uh, and making sure that in California we're, we're doing our best um, to, enhance and, and rebuild the salmon stocks that we have here um, to support southern resident killer whales. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. I mean, along the coast, and that's why it's so challenging, you know, because they, they'll target, you know, runs off of California, you know, off of off of Oregon. Um, but then uh, the salmon themselves with their their movements, it's so it, it's so variable. And it's an international issue because it's not just a U.S., you know, or, or, or Canadian um, you know, their transboundary, the Fisher transboundary. Um, so everybody just has to work together. Yeah, for sure. Um, do we know uh, what are the main drivers of decline in salmon? Um, I know that, um, oop, did I freeze or am I okay? Can you still hear me? I, my face is frozen, but I don't know if I you can. can. <laughs> I can still hear you. So <laughs> Okay, uh, you can hear me. It's just yeah. my, my face that's frozen. Um, uh, with, the, with recent attention has been um, paid to um, these declines and um, at sea survival, um, and that's due to a lot of the warming. It's also a lot of habitat loss. I just saw something recently. I think 90% of the habitat in the Fraser River um, has been lost um, for salmon. And so, with um, whether it's drought or whether it's development, um, I know just recently there's been a proposal to expand a port. Um, and in the Canadian waters, it's, a, it's, it's part of their critical habitat and key foraging area for them. Um, and so just a, a kind of a mix of the, and with 
Um, I think in, in some cases, um, obviously with fisheries management um, and, and both in the US and Canadian waters. Um, but it, it's something that people, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of, we're working really closely with a number of different groups of what you know, changes could be made to ensure that they get enough food. And what's that, what's that salmon threshold? Or, and, and you know, it might even be of what proportion of the Southern residents are in um, poor condition. And will, will that trigger something for adaptive management? Um, so it's a complicated, <laughs> complicated with salmon and complicated with the whales and uh, a lot of moving parts. But I know the majority of the money from, from NOAA too recently has been for habitat restoration um, and, and hatcheries um, and, and just to try to, to increase the overall numbers available. So it's much a much bigger problem than, than just an issue of, of dams and, and habitat um, loss on land that we, we need to think about. Right. Uh, other issues that are happening in the ocean. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's another, what you mentioned with dams, it's another example of that, that loss of areas <clears throat> that were important for the salmon to be able to, you know, spawn and, and increase in numbers. And so I know with, in cases where they have actually removed the dams, they've seen some positive recovery stories. But um, I know with, I, I would, haven't been involved that much in dam discussions, but it's, I think it's like, billions of dollars that is required to take down some of the dams um, and a lot of these dams they aren't even really supporting the amount of power that they need to the communities but it's just a money a money issue I think when it comes down to it of, of being able to deal with a lot of that but it could only be positive for the recovery of the, the salmon. Um, you had mentioned that uh, there was some uh, response to um, identifying animals as um, uh, being low in body condition, and there were some things now being applied to support those animals uh, in the wild. What are the things that monitoring agencies do uh, when you when you note that there's an animal in poor body condition? Um, well, well, now, and we've been working with um, uh, the Washington Department of, of Fish and Wildlife um, with those those two rulings, um, and that they were actually issued just a couple days after we provided that information. Um, so again, with the three pregnant pregnant um, females, and then with J fifty six, who's an animal of concern, um, they almost immediately issued a, a ruling saying that they increased distance for these commercial um, whale watch vessels um, to approach these whales. And on the Canadian side, um, they actually shut down all research on JPOD um, from research groups outside of ours, um, because that, you know, sometimes the, the research groups have a closer approach and, and more impact on the whales. Um, Canadian whale watch vessels are already not watching southern residents in, in Canadian waters. Um, so that that's something just overall on the Canadian side that they've they've been able to do. Um, and from the map that I show you, you can see there are a number of different fisheries closures and and you know closures to vessel areas on the Canadian side. So you've definitely been seeing a lot of a lot of momentum there. Um, and the Washington State, you know, more recently has really been, you know, they've been issuing these rulings and we're going to provide them with a full list of individuals of concern and pregnant females and animals with um, limited growth, and then they're going to be able to, to, you know, make adaptive man management changes prior to the start of the summer season here. Um, so it's been, we've been seeing real changes um, with management and with the past few years. And I know with NOAA, the, the region we've been talking recently about you know, what exactly they need to be able to take to the, you know, Pacific Salmon Fisheries Council or what, what exactly we can help provide um, to, to try to make changes there. Um, so. Uh, another question here. Um, do you know of any um, comprehensive studies of, of salmon in the, the southern part of the southern resident killer whales range in the, in the Monterey, Central California range? Are uh, are there efforts and studies monitoring salmon populations here in California? Oh yeah, I can I can definitely say yes because <laughs> um, there's so I mean there's so much effort going into that. I don't know, you know, with it, I, I think it would be from um, a state, you know, there'd be state and federal um, funding and work going into that. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it's amazing. We just saw the breakdown from just even Washington state with the amount of, of money that was going towards whether it's restoration projects or, you know, different projects monitoring, you know, abundance, um, some offshore work, 
hatchery work. I mean, it's just millions and millions and millions of dollars. So I'm sure the same applies to to California on the state level. And then um, the federal, you know, NOAA provides a lot of support for that as well. I don't specifically know, though, but I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, so there's a question here. Do you know of any, um, I, I know we're doing, uh, or there, there are some proposed projects for desalination here in Southern California. Is there anything in uh, Pacific Northwest through to Northern California um, as far as desalination programs that might endanger um, uh, our salmon stocks? I, I, I do not know. I, um, I don't know that. I, I was working with some of the folks with, with Washington State um, about they were um, coming up with a uh, a tool that you they were taking in, whether it's like wastewater, whether it's you know salmon abundance, whether it's body condition. They were basically pulling all the impacts of a number of different you know things that could contribute uh, to, to declines or negative impacts on southern resident killer whales and other fish populations. I know it, I saw desalination in that, but I don't know of any any particular programs. It's out of my knowledge range. <laughs> um, really quickly, I'm gonna I'm gonna sum up a bunch of questions that we had about um, you know different aspects of of what can people do um, to to help out with this issue from uh, personal actions through civic actions through providing public comment in in various public comment periods. Is there a, a space that people can go to to learn more? Um, I would say with, I know with the West Coast region and, and NOAA fisheries, they have a really comprehensive um, page on um, with Southern resident killer whales. And so they, you know, I'm sure there'd be a number of different, you know, I had to, well, I actually, I sent that, I looked at it the other day um, um, for you and sending that. And so it was actually really comprehensive of all the different, um, you know, Things that they're doing to help help recover the population. Um, public comment periods that all you know it really kind of varies on what's going on at the current time. When I mentioned up in Canadian waters, I had a comment, public comment period for the development of the port. I know with the port of Vancouver, there's been something um, similar a number of years ago. Uh, there was the discussion on um, uh, the closure of the west side of San Juan Island um, to, to vessels, and there was a public comment period for that. So they're always, I'm sure with NOAA, you'd be able to see a lot of postings, maybe, maybe at a state level as well. Um, the Washington State Task Force um, uh, you know, they're, you know, still ongoing. Um, and so I'm sure they'd be able to provide, um, you know, there'd be some links on that to be able to access, you know, for any kind of public comment. I would say, you know, just eating, eating locally and sustainably. I mean, there are a number of different, I, you know, my John is, um, you know, he hadn't been able to even think about a king king salmon in a long time, you know, but I mean, it's one of those to where there's certain certain salmon that are sustainably caught um, that are that are definitely better to eat. And that that goes across the board for a number of different um, types of fish. I know Monterey Bay, the aquarium used to have a really nice um, list of, of sustainable fish. I'm a vegetarian, so I'm not as familiar yeah. with it, but I know that they you do have watch. this list. Yeah. Um, but, it, but yeah, just with sustainable, you know, local living to be aware of what's going on, whether it's off of the California coast and, and developments that might impact certain populations, like you said, with, with fisheries management, um, what's going on with your local, local fish populations. Um, but I'd say definitely NOAA would be a really good source. And then, and then whether it's California state, you know, department of fish and wildlife or Washington state. Uh, so if if you guys go to the chat real quick, there's a lot of uh, links uh, being shared in here. Um, Diane, thank you. Uh, just share the link to the salmon recovery from, uh, looks like, well, there's a link there that you can find more about uh, information about that. Um, there's some questions about um, the best sort of uh, outfits or ways to go whale watching for, for whale watches. Um, and someone has shared a link in there, but I, I do know that, that there's different kinds of certifications and, and things like that, that uh, whale watch operations have to, to let you know that they're, they're operating in a, in a sound way. Um, yeah. So definitely. And one of the, research. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to, and I, I mentioned it briefly just with, um, you know, and it's not just necessarily impacts of, of whale watch vessels, it's impacts of, of all vessels out mm -hmm. on the water too. I mean, it's research vessels, it's, 
That's why we try to have such a, a small footprint on the whales. It's recreational vessels, it's commercial whale watch vessels. So I think everybody has to, you know, just be responsible um, about giving the whales space, dolphin space, different areas. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I know with Southern California, there's, you know, a, you know, a lot of uh, vessel activity, uh, you know, as well. And so, but there are a lot more, a lot more dolphins down there. So, <laughs> but it is, it's just the impact of everyone and it's physical and acoustic disturbance. Um, and I know different areas. I saw, I saw one of the things across the bottom about the, the shore based, you know, whale watching in different areas. I know on the San Juan Islands, the um, Lime Kiln Lighthouse um, and that, you know, the entire West side, you know, you can always see when the whales do show up and they're along there, you can always see so many people on shore um, taking advantage of that view. Um, so it depends in gray whales, you can see them going along the coast and, um, you know, I know Piedras Blancas is a great spot, you know, that area is the south of Big Sur to see, see them. Well, um, I think, Holly, thank you so much for, for taking some time to talk to us about um, this really critical issue today. Um, it's been fascinating and I think, um, you know, one of the most important things that we all can do um, in this issue is to, to make our voices heard. So we all have elected representatives, both uh, state, federal, and municipal, that if you're deeply uh, interested in making sure that um, southern resident killer whales um, are, are protected, um, one of the best things you can do is to make sure that your elected representatives know that that's an issue that you are uh, passionate about. And the more of us that share that, with our, our elected representatives, um, the more attention that will come to helping to protect these animals and the, and the more support that people like uh, Dr. Fernbach will, will uh, have to, to research and, and support uh, conservation of, of, of these animals. So thank you so much for taking some time and thank you everyone for joining us uh, tonight. Um, we wanna thank uh, Marathon also for supporting our, our lecture series that we have. Um, all of our lectures are recorded and archived on Marine Mammal Care Center's website. You can learn more about uh, marine mammals in lots of different aspects uh, in our archived uh, sections under education in our research, uh, resource library. Um, so check those out if you're interested in, in learning more and uh, check your emails and social media for our next lecture. We don't have one scheduled um, just yet. Uh, but we're working on that. We'll have more to bring you from Marine Mammal Care Center in the near future. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dr. Fernbach, for uh, sharing all of this really fascinating information with us tonight. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Sorry, my video stalled. It's one of the things that's living off the grid and having <laughs> different internet issues. So, but at least I, it, hopefully everything came through okay with the presentation. So Every, thanks for having was, me. Everything was fantastic. Thanks so much. Great. Of course. Okay. Have a good night. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.